Have your way. Have your way in us. Reign in us, Lord God. And Father, while we're going through these really difficult times right now, our world is in crisis. Our nation is in crisis, Lord. Our country. Our valley. Our homes, Lord. So much is going on right now. We need you desperately, Lord, to move. Lord, we need you to cry out enough and to stop this thing, Lord God. Would you move your hand and say no more? And would you bring healing to your people, healing to our homes, healing to our nation, healing to our world, Lord God? Would you bring restoration? Would you restore us, Lord God? Revive our hearts to you, Lord. And let us look to you for our every need. Lord, you are the only one who can fulfill everything that we need, Lord. And so we turn to you and we look to you right now. We say, have your way, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your incredible goodness to us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I love you. been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God
Thank you for tuning in to our Faith Assembly online experience. We're so glad you're able to join us today from the comfort of your own home or from wherever you find yourself at. I have a couple of announcements for you. Number one is our Zoom faith groups. And if you are interested in joining one of our incredible Zoom faith groups that have been taking place throughout the week, why don't you visit us at ivyfaithassembly.org or you can go to our Facebook page and get more information through there. Secondly is CityServe. We have been able to bless numerous amounts of families in the Imperial Valley since we've been a part of CityServe. And we really want to partner up with you. So if you know of anybody that is in need, please let us know and reach out to us so that we can be able to be a blessing to many more families here in the Imperial Valley. And lastly, we just want to say thank you to all our supporters that have been keeping this ministry afloat. Not only are we grateful for your continued support, but I know that our missionaries that are working on foreign soil are extremely grateful as well. And I just want to remind you that you can continue to give by going to our website at ivyfaithassembly.org. You can mail in your offering. You can come by the church and drop it off. Or if you're not comfortable yet in leaving your home, you can call someone in the office and they will gladly pick it up. We hope that you have an incredible Memorial Day. Be blessed. We love you. The wilderness has great significance in the Bible. I looked in the dictionary to find the definition of wilderness, and it is a region uncultivated and uninhabited by human beings. Like a desert, that's a type of wilderness. But a forest can be a wilderness too, uncultivated, uninhabited by humans. Paul and Jesus and Moses, they all spent significant amounts of time in the wilderness. Each found themselves in that wilderness for different reasons, and each was permanently influenced and affected by what happened there. Uh, the coronavirus, stay-at-home orders, they're, they're a kind of wilderness experience for us right now. Financial pressures, relational conflicts, and health battles, I think that all qualifies as wilderness experiences. But I want to share with you today that growth, your growth, actually happens in the wilderness. You see, the way of the wilderness can be a place where God builds you up. It's a, it's a place where you can learn to trust God. The wilderness is really a growth opportunity. So if you're looking at your present circumstance, and feeling like you're in a wilderness, I've got great news for you. It's an incredible opportunity for you to grow. So, do you want to grow in the wilderness? Great. Then, then do these two things. One is set well-defined goals. This will allow you to measure your progress. I talked to one person who told me uh, last week that she had lost 22 pounds during the quarantine. She had set a definable goal. I myself have a goal. I'm trying to learn a, a memory verse from every single chapter of the book of Psalms right now. So I'm going through every chapter and picking out one or more verses, and I'm, and I'm working on all that. It's just a goal that I have. Maybe your goal is to grow in faith. Set some goals, definable goals. The second Thing. If you want to grow in faith, if you want to grow during this wilderness time, you've got to exert maximum effort. You see, lasting growth takes maximal effort. It's interesting, science has a lot to say about this. The, the, uh, the scientists are saying that you have to stress your body if you want to grow in your body. You have to stress your mind if you want to grow in learning. You have to be stressed spiritually in order to experience spiritual growth. But if you want to grow in any of those areas, you have to give at least 70% effort. You see, that 70% mark is important. If you give at least 70% effort when you're doing physical exercise, you will increase your stamina you'll increase your abilities. Anything less is just maintenance. So just being stressed 
spiritually doesn't grow you. Just being stressed physically may not grow you. It has to be you pushing forward with your effort. You see, in order to grow in the wilderness, you got to find that sweet spot between pushing maybe in a way that's just too easy because you're going to get bored and quit or too hard, too difficult, it'll be impossible and you'll, you'll give up. And either way, you won't achieve your goals. Find the sweet spot between too easy and impossible. You got to be deliberate if you want to use this time in the wilderness to grow spiritually. And I always encourage people to engage in spiritual disciplines. What, what are those? You know, it's the things we talk about a lot, like reading your Bible, studying the Bible, uh, praying regularly, uh, going to church, participating in our faith groups, Zoom online groups, and things like that. But you've got to push. Let's say you pray for five minutes a day right now and you say, I want to become a prayer warrior. Why don't you push to 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Or if you're at 15 minutes, why don't you say, I'm going to pray for a half an hour every day or whatever it might be. I read one chapter of the Bible. If you want to grow in your faith, maybe it's time to read two chapters or four chapters of the Bible. You've got to exert effort. To grow, you have to find a place of uncomfortableness. That's the wilderness. And in a moment, we're going to talk about a bunch of scriptures where we see all these things come to life. Comfort does not help you grow. And our goal is to grow in faith. Love, grow, connect, serve, share. This is one of the five things that we do at Faith Assembly. The wilderness will help you grow. Let me say this. You show me the last time that you genuinely felt uncomfortable or stressed. And I will show you the last time that you either grew or you had the opportunity to grow. You see, we don't grow without that uncomfortableness. And this is one of the reasons why I'm telling you that, that the wilderness that you're in right now is, is a really good and important place to be. The wilderness is not about avoiding obstacles. It's about facing them and even defeating them with the Lord's help. You see, God brings us into the wilderness for a reason. It's for our benefit. I always chuckle when I read this scripture. This is a memory verse of mine, so I know it. But when I think about it, James says this in chapter 1 uh, of James. It says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. That's when I chuckle. Like, really? Hey, Dan, I got some really bad news for you. This is, this is supposed to be me considering it all joy. But the Bible says that when we do face various trials, when we find ourselves in the wilderness, like you find yourself in right now, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, what we have to do to grow in the wilderness is apply the truth that we know. The biggest problem is not that you need to know more truth. We don't need to know more. We need to do more of what we already know. Even if you're a baby Christian, you probably know a lot of things that God wants you to do from the Bible that, that you're not doing so well. You want to grow? Start applying with effort the things that you already know to do. And then learn some new things to do as well. The other thing is when you're in the wilderness and you want to grow, you've got to do something. You've got to push. You're in the wilderness and I'm asking you to push. You've got to fight. Don't just roll over and play dead. Don't be passive. This is an amazing opportunity. This a crazy time of pandemic. It's an opportunity to grow in significant and lasting ways. 
I pray that one of these days, one of these years, you're going to look back at this time period and you're going to say, wow, look what God did during the pandemic of 2020. Here's another thing that can happen in the wilderness before I really start talking about Paul and Jesus and Moses and what they experienced in the wilderness. Growth happens, and we just talked about that. But I want to say one other thing, and it might not be what you expect. Healing from past hurts happens or can happen in the wilderness. Past hurts are the kind of things that puts you in a present wilderness. Some of the things that happened to you as a child, some of the trauma that happened to you as a teenager, as an adult, it puts you into the wilderness because of our mindset or how we respond to those things. And the wilderness is the perfect time to actively seek healing for past hurts. You see, you are not going to get very far unless you can find healing from your past hurts. It's interesting. It's kind of like a stereotype, you know, like you see in the movies or cartoons or something. Where, where you've got the psychiatrist's office and the person is laying on the couch there and, the, and the, the psychiatrist says in a German accent, tell me about your mother. Tell me about your childhood. Well, it's very true. You see, we've got to be humble enough to look at our lives in the wilderness and face the truth about your internal condition and my internal condition, my issues. And you and I have got to allow the Holy Spirit access to work in us. Sometimes working through those issues will get you out of the wilderness because sometimes that's what brought you in to the wilderness. But sometimes you and I are not willing to face that it was our own behavior, our own choices. Sometimes the way we learn to deal with the dysfunction of our past becomes dysfunctional patterns in our future that lead us into the wilderness. That's crazy, isn't it? There are coping mechanisms and behaviors and mindsets that we learn early in life and we unconsciously get off track and we sabotage ourselves by just doing the stuff that we did. Sometimes people become really quiet and they never tell anyone what they think because it was unsafe in their family to do that. Sometimes people become extremely aggressive because that's the only way that they could, could really cope with the dysfunction in their house. Sometimes people have alcohol and, and addiction issues because of that. Sometimes we have anger issues. There are all sorts of behaviors that we just live daily and we don't even think about it. And the, and the wilderness is a great time to intentionally heal and analyze and allow the Holy Spirit to scan you and come up with the results like we talked about last week. In Psalm 34, 17, uh, through 19 it says the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their trouble not some of their trouble all of their troubles the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers them out of them all I love the word all he he will deliver you out of all your destructive patterns and brokenness and hurts from the past is something that you can accomplish in the wilderness. You see, Paul and Jesus and Moses each spent time in the wilderness. And so I want to ask this question. What can we learn from those who have traveled the wilderness before us? Let's look at Paul first. Paul's wilderness experience was a little different than some. He chose it. You see, he used it for training and learning and growing in his faith. You see, he found himself on his backside on the road to Damascus and Jesus himself appeared to him. 
He had a personal encounter with Jesus. So much so that he called himself an apostle for the rest of, their li the rest of his life. And apostles have to have spent time with Jesus. And nobody questioned that he was an apostle. Jesus appeared to him. You know what's interesting is, is Paul didn't just uh, have an experience where Jesus revealed himself and, and met with him and changed his life. Paul didn't just say, hey, great, I've met Jesus. I'm going to go out and preach the gospel from now on. This is really interesting. Look at what happened in Galatians 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, I did not consult with man after that experience with Jesus. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. I didn't check in with all the leaders. But it said this, I went immediately into Arabia. He went to the wilderness. He went to the desert. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Isn't this interesting? He meets Jesus, but instead he goes into the wilderness for three years. And I love this. Just before those verses, it says this in, in verse 12 of Galatians 1. It says, I did not receive my revelation of who Jesus is and, and the learning from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. I mean, this is crazy. Paul received the revelation of, of his faith and his understanding. He went to the backside of a desert for three years to study the, the Bible, the Old Testament. He was a Pharisee. He was already an expert in the Bible, in the Old Testament portion. And he studied that. And, and, and Jesus himself taught him. That's what the scripture says. And then after three years, he was ready to go. And then he comes back and he introduces himself to the other apostles in Jerusalem. You know what's interesting? I've seen this a lot. People have a salvation experience and that's amazing. But sometimes people think, bam, I'm going to go immediately and be the leader of this and, and this and that. Well, God's called you to, to, to share your faith and to, and to connect with believers and, and to minister in His name. But He's also called you to take some deep time to grow. And sometimes we see failure because people jump in too fast. Take that time in the wilderness that you're in right now to grow. Let's talk about Moses. Moses had a different kind of wilderness experience. You see, Moses went there for 40 years because of sin. Numbers uh, chapter 14 verses 21 through 23 said, not one of the men who saw my glory, this is God speaking, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their fathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. God sent Moses and a couple of million Hebrews to the desert as a punishment. It wasn't their choice. And it wasn't God's original plan. You know, the Bible uh, indicates that, that it was an 11-day walk from Egypt to the Promised Land. And maybe God meant for them just to go straight in there. But because of their sin and rebellion, they took the 40-year route. You see, sin and unbelief, selfish behavior, in you and I will always cause a wilderness experience. If we get caught up in sin, I'm not just talking about making a mistake now and then, I'm talking about practicing sin, giving yourself over to sin in a certain area and just living there you're going to be in the wilderness. If you're a believer and, and you're constantly living in some area of sin, you're just going to be in the wilderness. 
But I'll tell you, God is so gracious and he's so amazing that even in the wilderness, God was faithful to the Hebrews. He provided for them. He protected for them. He led and guided them with the, with the pillar of fire and, and with direction through his servant Moses. And if, you're in, if you are in a wilderness right now because of your sin, well, have no fear. God is still ready to provide and bless and protect and lead you out of that. William Booth was a man who was the founder of the Salvation Army. And in the early 1900s, he said this, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Spirit. You ever seen that? We see that in church sometimes. People who are trying to live a Christian life without the Spirit, without a true life-transforming relationship with God, will always find themselves in a desert experience. You have to have that relationship with Him. You've got to be plugged in with Him. And the, and the Hebrews didn't have that. They, they were kind of playing at religion, but they weren't devoted to God. They weren't trusting in Him. And they found themselves 40 years in the desert. And that's the same thing that we experience. I just pray that if you are in a tough spot, and you've caused your wilderness experience because your own behavior, your own attitudes, you know you did. It's time to really plug in with God and allow Him to lead you to a new one. So you got Paul, who went to the desert to grow and learn. You got Moses, who went to the desert as a punishment. And, and my last example today is this. Jesus went to the wilderness for a really unique reason. The Bible says that he went there specifically to be tempted by the devil. That's what Matthew 4, verse 1 says. That Jesus went to the devil, excuse me, went to the wilderness to specifically be tempted by the devil. Sometimes God will lead you into a dry place, into a wilderness, into a desert place, so that he can test you and build you up so that you can accomplish what he's called you to do. You see, the human side of Jesus, Jesus was all man, but he was all divine too. But that human side of Jesus needed to learn to trust God and to battle with his enemy, the devil. And you and I have to learn the same thing. We've got to learn how to not give in to temptation and win spiritual battles. This is so important. It was so important that Jesus was sent to the desert in order to learn these incredible skills that he must have. Let me read this to you from Mark, verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he just got baptized by, by John the Baptist. He saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. Now, l l let me just kind of break this down. So you got this, you got this picture Jesus goes to John the Baptist to be baptized. He gets baptized. He, he comes up out of the water. And it is like a crescendo in history. He, he comes up out of the water. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove on, on him. He is filled with this immense anointing and powerful blessing of the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? 
He goes on to the bank of the river and he says, gather around. I am now ready to tell you about my father and I want to tell you about salvation that can be found in me and that you can have a relationship with God. Is that what he did? It's not what he did. He comes up out of the water being baptized and the Holy Spirit comes upon him in a powerful, powerful way. And it says, at once the Spirit sent him into the desert. Isn't that interesting? I would have thought this would be the perfect time. The voice from heaven said, this is my son, I'm well pleased. I mean, then the Holy Spirit descending, this would have been the perfect occasion, Jesus for you to start your ministry. Boy, wouldn't that have been great? Well, they didn't put me in charge of that. They put someone a little smarter than me. The Holy Spirit immediately sends them into the wilderness. After, immediately after the wilderness, in the very next verse, so in verse 13, it says they, the Spirit immediately sends him into the wilderness. In verse 14 of Mark 1, it says Jesus then went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. So there were 40 days in between the baptism, the Holy Spirit descending, and the voice of God proclaiming, this is my son. Forty days to be tempted and built up by God and to discover the strength that would be needed. And then he comes out with his ministry. Church, you and I, it's so important that we learn how to handle temptation. It's so important that Jesus didn't even start his ministry till after he had that lesson. I saw something that blew my mind and when I first saw it, I immediately disagreed with it but then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, boy, there's a point here. One pastor suggested that the high point of human history wasn't the cross and resurrection. Well, hold it. I and every other minister have preached that the cross and the resurrection are the high point of human history. Everything before points to the cross and resurrection and everything after points back. But this pastor pointed to what I just talked about, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness as the high point in human history. Why would he do that? Because that is where Jesus learned the obedience and, and, and the, the discipline that would allow him to fulfill the cross and the resurrection that came directly from his time in the wilderness. So maybe the most important thing in history is Jesus' wilderness, which taught him to be obedient so that he could die on the cross and be raised from the dead. Ask yourself this question, what can I learn from this wilderness? What can I understand? What is God trying to teach you in this wilderness of the quarantine, of the virus? I pray you'll get the most out of your time in the wilderness. As some of you know, when I went to college at age 19, I was a music major. And in my undergraduate days studying music, I remember one of my music history classes. The professor told us a story that I will never forget. You see, during World War I in Germany, a man went to the fish market, 
The war had taken its toll on the German economy and there were shortages of everything. And in this case, paper was in short supply. So the man goes to the fish market, he orders some fish, and when he got home, he noticed that the fish had been wrapped in music paper. It wasn't like a machine published sheet of music. It was a handwritten score in pen and ink. The music wasn't very legible because, you know, it had fish guts all over it. And so the customer went back to the fish market and he asked to see the paper that they were using to wrap the fish. And the store owner uh, took him to a back room and he opened a large trunk. And in that trunk, it was filled with handwritten music. The owner explained that they had run out of their usual fish wrapping paper. And so they started using this paper that had been left in the old trunk by the previous owner of this shop. The customer inspected the music more closely and discovered that all the music had been composed by and signed by Johann Sebastian Bach. Some of the music that we listen to today from Bach actually came through this trunk in the back room of a fish market during World War II in Germany. I'm sickened at the thought that some of Bach's masterpieces may have been lost to history because uh, it got used for wrapping uh, fish, but I digress. As the newly found music scores were analyzed, a curious marking on the corner of each page was discovered. It was an acronym written in Latin. The English equivalent would be F-G-O-G. Music historians studied this for a long time and they finally discovered the meaning in the Latin. The English translation for F-G-O-G would be for the glory of God. Just think about it. On every page of the greatest musical masterpieces in history, the greatest composer of all time, in my humble opinion, on every page he wrote F-G-O-G, for the glory of God. As I sat in class listening to my music professor tell the story, I was inspired down to my core. And I determined at that moment that I wanted not just my music, but my whole life to carry the inscription F-G-O-G -G, for the glory of God. And as you journey through the wilderness that is called the coronavirus pandemic of 2020, I pray that the inscription in the corner of every page of your life in this wilderness, we would find the initials F-G-O-G -G, for the glory of God. Would you bow your head, please? Lord, I just pray for each one. I pray, God, that each one would make a decision right now. That their life in this wilderness is going to be used for your glory. It's going to be a time of growth. It's going to be a time of healing from past wounds. It's going to be a time of getting out of sin. And it's going to be a time of being prepared to face temptation with victory. It's going to be a time that we look back and we say, look at that life lived 
for the glory of God. I just want to speak to you right now. Maybe you are in a place, you're, you're far away from the Lord, and you are ready to give your life. You just feel that tenderness in your heart that says, I want to give my life to Jesus. Listen, if you are ready to give your life to Jesus, would you pray this prayer with me? I'm going to pray, and then you just pray the words after me. I'm gonna, we're going to ask God to forgive us, we're going we're gonna to invite him to come in, Jesus, to come into our life. We're going to give him our life. We're going to make him the leader and Lord of our life. And then we're just going to tell him that we're going to live for him for the rest of our days and then into eternity. And if that's your desire right now, if you want to pray with me to give your life to Jesus, to give your life back to Jesus, because you got into the wilderness and you kind of left him you, you got into the wilderness because you left the Lord. Will you pray this prayer with me? Bow your head and just repeat this prayer after me right now. Dear Heavenly Father. That's right, just repeat. Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me for all my sins. I'm sorry that I've not lived for you, but that change is starting today. I want to make Jesus the Lord and leader of my life. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. So, Lord, I give you my life, and I will never take it back. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I am so thrilled that you prayed that prayer. If you prayed that prayer, just write a comment below. Say, I prayed with Pastor Dan this morning. I prayed with Pastor Dan tonight or this evening, whenever you're watching. And... Uh, We'll connect with you and help you grow in your faith. We just want to close out this uh, service on the internet. We want to close it out by inviting our worship team to come back and to just lead us in one more song where you can just think about the wilderness and what God can do in your life at this time. God bless you. We'll see you this week in our Zoom faith groups, our small groups, and we'll see you next Sunday for another service. God bless you. We love you.